to my computer. There we are. So we're just waiting for a few more people to join us. Um, good evening to everybody if you're in the UK or the rest of Europe. Um, good, is it morning or is it afternoon? <laughs> Well, noon here in California. Okay, good day. <laughs> good lunchtime uh, if you're in the US. Um, if you're in Australia, you're probably asleep anyway. So <laughs> probably not joining us from Australia. So welcome everybody um, that's here. Uh, my name is Kathy Wassell and I run Autistic Girls Network, uh, which if you don't know, you probably do know, but if you don't know, um, is a charity that supports uh, autistic girls and women and their family and campaigns for earlier diagnosis. And I am joined tonight or today, depending on where you are, um, by Sally. Uh, Sally J. Pla, who is a, a neurodivergent author, and we are going to talk about well, quite a few things tonight, really, but we're going to talk about neurodivergency, we're going to talk about books, uh, we're going to talk about what changes we'd like to see in the world, even. So let's get started, and I will just keep an eye um, on the on if anyone's joining us and let them in. So, Sally, welcome, and thank you uh, for coming along tonight, or <laughs> at lunchtime, where you are. Time yeah. differences get very confusing, especially when you've got a menopausal brain like me. So, <laughs> so nice. you've got a new book to talk about today, uh, The Fire, The Water and Maudie McGinn. Am I, am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and Maudie, I know, is a neurodivergent main character. So we're definitely going to be talking about her. There she is. <laughs> definitely going to be talking about her but I thought we could start off by talking about uh, neurodivergence generally and how um, you discovered it and kind of what it means to you really I guess whatever you like to say on that subject <laughs> all right well you know I'm a late diagnosed um, autistic person I didn't get my diagnosis till I think I was 54 which is around seven years ago um, yeah, it, you know, all my life, I just it struggled, struggled so hard. I went through periods at school where I was mute. I would refuse to go to school. I had a mother who my mom is probably on the spectrum as well, and is a, a very different kind of personality in person. And she would let me stay home from school, which now that I look back, I think was a blessing because she just knew when I was burnt out, I would have to do it. I knew the nurse's room intimately well at school. I would lie on the couch and hold my stomach and just need to go. But nobody knew why. They just thought I was an extraordinarily shy kid. I was very bright. I always knew the answers to all the questions. I knew everything. It never troubled me academically to be missing school. I just couldn't abide. I just couldn't handle the sensory stress of it. But of course, nobody realized that. Um, uh, growing up, it started to feel like the world was more and more bewildering. I think I'm speaking to a classic experience of a young autistic girl growing up. But of course, back then, who knew? I grew up, you know, as a young girl in the late 60s and early 70s, mid 70s, nobody knew. Um, so it was just really tough. I was just told to, you know, that's ridiculous. Get over it. You're silly. You shouldn't think that way. You shouldn't feel that way. You're being too sensitive. Um, I have a poem actually of all of those things, you know, like a hundred different things that people used to tell me to just get over myself. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. So it was a massive, um, massive issue. I, you know, I, I pulled it together through, you know, I managed to get through college, um, found a first job, uh, burned, loved my job, was very good at it. My bosses really loved me. I was a, an editor and a writer at a business magazine, and it was very high powered. I did very well for a short period of time, then completely burnt out and looked for an excuse to leave. Um, this seemed to be a pattern for a while and I still didn't know why, you know, I feel like sometimes I say I didn't really feel like I was an adult until I was in my mid thirties, you know, things didn't really come together for me to feel like a, a capable person in the world until then. Um, and then having my boys made everything so much better. I, I love being a stay at home mom. I had three sons. Uh, my middle boy, by the time he was three years old, had a diagnosis of sensory processing disorder. Um, you know, we went through the diagnostical gamut 
We ran through so many things before at age 10, 11, he finally got his autism diagnosis. He's autistic with OCD. My oldest is also neurodivergent, my youngest as well, um, in different ways. My husband as well, now that I look at it, my mother. My sister has inattentive ADHD. I have a nephew that is ADHD, autistic, and with uh, intellectual delays. Um, I have great uncles, I have aunts. If you look in our family tree, it's everywhere. Um, yeah, so why did it take me until I was 54? <laughs> I was always a writer. Yeah, you know, I was always a writer. And I, I finally, at that middle age, decided I was going to try to write books for children because that was my passion and my joy with my boys. I just loved writing about family and children and not so much about writing corporate reports and things. So I wrote my first book, The Sunday Birds, about a boy named Charlie. Um, who goes on a cross-country journey with his dad, oh, to, excuse me, with his uh, sister and his little brothers and a mysterious babysitter to meet his dad, who's been injured in Afghanistan and is in a hospital across the country. And it sounds like a sad setup, but it's a really pretty lighthearted look at what it's like to be an autistic kid that's yanked out of your comfort zone and forced to go on this journey. Um, and I thought I was writing it for my son. Um, it turns out the voice was really me and it was triggering for me about my own childhood. It put me into therapy, just the writing of the book did. And the therapist said, hmm, have you ever thought of getting tested yourself? And I did. And that's what led me to my diagnosis and my realization that I really wanted to write books about these kids, about our kids, the kids I knew, um, you know, my family, everything that felt familiar to me. There were not enough books like that, not enough characters like that out in the world. Definitely. And, we, you know, representation matters and it's it's so important. And I don't know, it's 2023 feels like quite a good year for that so far. Uh, you know, we've had I don't know if you've been able to see it in the US, but we've had um, the BBC series of A Kind of Spark, um, which, you know, made a big splash. Um, we've got Geek Girls being filmed right now. Um, so it feels like things are things are happening which is good yeah it's definitely good it's amazing even just the past five years how things have changed and what's come out so mm -hmm. that's great stuff um well actually that is one of my questions so we might as well go to that now um what would you say has changed in the world of neurodiversity um in the last five years awareness and acceptance both it's, you know, I think we're finally reaching a point where the, the message is out there enough. And I think social media has helped to amplify this and also to connect us to each other so that we can amplify and support each other. Um, I think that, that it's really just growing and it's going to get better. I feel optimistic about it, you know, especially about this, our new young next generation coming up that are so open. Um, that are so into learning and accepting. Uh, I just think kids and young people today are amazing and that they have so much to offer and that their mindset about the world is, you know, really open and honest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I feel optimistic about it. I, I also just love that we support each other. I, you know, I, have, I feel like I have a network of other autistic authors. They're not tons of us, but they're enough of us that we can you know, support each other and, and lift each other up and support each other's work. And I think that's a really important and good thing that we need to do. And do you find that there has been a change in publishing uh, and commissioning of work I, about neurodivergence? I would hope there would be more. I, here in the US, I think we're, we're getting that for sure we're getting there. But I do hear from autistic and neurodivergent um, writers that are struggling to become to be published, that it's still pretty hard, that you still get the response of from editors and agents that I, you know, I just didn't relate to that, or I couldn't relate to that, or, your character did not seem relatable, your character is acting in ways that don't seem right, or whatever. And you know, of course not, because they're neurodivergent characters. Um, and I think publishing is probably 99% not neurodivergent at this point. So it's, it is a tricky thing. I think it's getting better. I think the level of respect and willingness to learn is getting way better. 
I feel really lucky with the editors that I have uh, right now and I, I feel really supported so but it's been a journey it definitely has been a journey with a lot of slings and arrows along the way <laughs> mm. okay so um let's go back to Maudie um, and she is school age isn't she uh, and she's having a tough time so um how how much of a tough time that Maudie is having at school or out of school is the tough time that you had? Um, Maudie's tough time at home is a lot of the tough time that I had. Um, she is a girl who spends the school years with her mother and now this past year, a brand new stepdad. Um, and then in the summer, she spends with her dad in California. She spends school years in Texas, summers in California with her dad. She'd much rather be with her dad, really, really would much rather be with her dad. The new stepdad um, cannot, gets very frustrated with her behaviors, doesn't seem to understand them. And um, he gets abusive, he, he loses his temper. Um, there are anger attacks, sometimes physical, and it's just really a terrible scene. And the mother for this you know, new stepfather is sort of a lifeline for them socioeconomically. And everything, it's, you know, they've had a hard time, Maudie and her mom. And um, her mom just doesn't want her to talk about it and tells her, you know, keep that a secret. We're, you know, that's really important that, that you keep this terrible thing a secret. And her mom doesn't do anything to help. Um, so that is sort of the setup of the secret that Maudie has to keep and the problem that she has to unravel and solve for herself to survive and to to find her way through this summer, this kind of crucible summer of changes where these waves of change have been hitting her, um, you know, waves of change with her mother and this terrible stepfather. She goes to visit her dad, but a wildfire destroys their beloved cabin. They end up needing to evacuate and they end up at dad's old hometown, a little beach town in Southern California, very much like the one I live in. And, um, it just changes things for her. She finds this little community in this campground. She starts to explore. She starts to, she falls in love with surfing. She finds this be beautiful, amazing mentor woman that she asks, she gets up the courage to ask to be taught because she wants to so desperately that she, she speaks her desire and um, ends up learning to surf. She, she tries to win a surfing competition because there's a beginner surf competition with money and she thinks maybe it'll help her dad, maybe that way she could stay with him if she can, you know, win this, uh, this sum of money. She's trying all these ways. She's not trying the most important way, which is to tell her truth. Um, and it's her journey to that. And the book is about her journey to that and her journey to strength and resilience and realizing her own um, power. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I did not, yeah. and I'm surprising I did not answer your question. I just talked about Oh, that's all right. That's okay. I'm not sure but, I asked, uh, asked a question. Yeah, um, no, no. You said like which, which part is uh, from me and which part is or of the school and the home. But you know, I did have that problem, and I do want to really speak to that if it's okay. Because mm. um, yeah, my my I didn't get along with my dad growing up. He didn't understand my autistic behaviors. We clashed. He um, would get ang He would have these massive anger attacks on me when I was a kid. And it was really hard. It was trauma. It was definitely a huge trauma that um, reverberated through my life and you know my own self esteem. It got me involved in other relationships that ended up in domestic violence and trauma because I just didn't because that was what I was used to. I didn't understand. Um, it really threw me for a big loop growing up, and it set me far back. Um, but. I also knew that my dad really loved me. He was just so frustrated. He didn't know what to do. And I was such a sensitive kid. Um, so, I, you know, I was looking at statistics and realizing that kids with disabilities, so, you know, kids either, you know, intellectual, mental or, or physical disabilities um, are abused at rates that are 10, up to 10 times higher than just regular kids. It's a big issue when the adults in your life get frustrated at you. And I wanted to, I wanted to speak to that. I wanted to speak to that. And, you know, my dad is not the stepfather in this book. He's, um, but it, you know, it's all fictional, but, um, you know, it's based a lot on those feelings of wanting to, wanting to reach at that and wanting to get across that message that um, we need to find our strength to tell, to find safe adults and tell, to be mm. honest. Mm. And, you know, teenage years are pretty 
tough anyway, aren't they? And they're kind of we're, when we're forming our identity. And of course, if you don't know that you're autistic, it's difficult to form an identity, isn't it? So how if you kind of look back, how was that for you? You know, how was that that kind of formation of self-identity? I was just totally bewildered, but I didn't know who I was at all. I was a different person for everyone I met. I, you know, I just would put on the different, I felt like a chameleon. I was just a chameleon. Sometimes I would think, am I just a shell? Where is the me inside of me? And of course, the advice you hear all the time when you're growing up is like, be yourself, just be yourself. And like, what does that mean? I had no idea what that meant. Who was myself? How was I supposed to be myself? I had no idea. I existed to make sure that everyone else around me felt happy. That was, so, you know, I was such a pleaser. And I think that part of that is coming from a background of some trauma, but it's also from the autistic background of just- mm. not yeah, quite we hear it a lot, yeah. yeah. We hear it a lot. And it's kind of that, it's it's almost like, be yourself, but, oh, but not like that. <laughs> yeah. Be yourself, I mean, but don't do that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly, Yeah. right. Something that's coming up a lot, actually, in uh, we were talking earlier, weren't we, that I've I've got this big deadline for my master's dissertation. And um, it's it's all about uh, the checklist that was in our white paper. And I've got a copy here somewhere, but actually I've got a blurred screen, haven't I? So you might not be able to see it anyway. Um, there's a checklist in there about an internal presentation. And that's what my dissertation is on. Um, and I got a, a huge number, more than a thousand responses to the survey. Um, and the same themes, you know, are, are coming out all the time. Things like, you know, yes, people pleasing, changing almost your personality to, to fit into situations. Um, almost cleverness as a kind of a scaffolding at school, um, kind of getting you through um you know, knowing the answers, being almost like being able to hide behind that, if you like. Um, and yet this real need for friends uh, and this real struggle with the socials, even if you managed with the academic side of it, that real struggle with the social side of it. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, it's it's a tough time, isn't it? Those teenage years for, it, for everybody, for all teenagers, but particularly for neurodivergent teenagers and particularly if you don't know that you're neurodivergent of course right exactly and you can feel so alone and so othered and friends are just it's a I used to call it the bewilderness like a, it's a wilderness that you're lost in and, you know adolescence was like and I I think that's going to be the title of one of my next books I was going to say that's a great title <laughs> because it is you're wandering like lost in this forest of social activities it's very confusing um and, you know, what helped me through always was reading and writing. You know, I, I think I went with writing because I would rewrite in my head and then later on in journals, um, interactions I would have, social interactions or ones that I wished that I could have, but I didn't know how to go about it. So I would, you know, lie there in bed at night before I would go to sleep and I would imagine like the interaction that I wished could have happened. And then I would write it out in dialogue and I started making up my own stories. And it all came out of that incredible wish of knowing how to connect that I couldn't figure out. And when I was young, I loved to read biographies because I, I, I figured, well, what can I learn at least from real people? Like, how did they do it? How did they solve this problem of how to be alive and how to survive and get through? And they were kind of my life lessons because you didn't find any characters. I couldn't find any characters like me in on the bookshelves. They were all just like Nancy Drew, like charging ahead, doing everything, getting things settled and figuring it out, you know, um, kicking butt and taking names. There was no character that was wandering through a bewilderness like me. So it was really important to me. Now it's really important to me to write those characters, you know, just as, as many of them I, as I can. Um, so that kids can know that they're not alone out there. There are other people that feel that way, all kinds of different ways. And yeah, so. Yeah, fabulous. That's exactly what we need. Okay. Um, so 
can't remember if it was on oh, I think it was on um the article that you sent me that you wrote for your publisher um and you talked about having a passionate sense of justice um mm. which we talk about a lot um at Autistic Girls Network you know I almost think like it ought to be in the diagnostic criteria of autism yeah. um do you try to weave that into your stories I don't yet uh, but you know, I'm working on one right now that it, that is getting at that for sure. Um, yeah, in terms of environmental, I haven't yet. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that lot used to lose me a lot of friends, even in adulthood. That has lost me friends uh, mm -hmm. when my kids were all young babies. Uh, my passionate social justice issue was pesticides on lawns it was just abhorrent I couldn't understand why this was happening I found a dead bird on my lawn I had little toddlers that crawled on a lawn it just I ended up working for the New York Coalition for Alternatives to Pesticides like just deep diving in it it was all I talked about for a couple of years and all my friends you know that I had from you know, having little toddlers together just just sort of stepped away from me because it was the only thing that I, I just it just mattered so much to me um, and then I kind of burnt out on it. And that's sort of been a pattern too. Like I'll find something that like that and then kind of burn out on it. I think actually now my special interest is, you know, writing books with characters that kids can relate to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, it, that has been a pattern. So what, are there any other kind of social justice special interests that spring to mind or let, let's talk about spins and special interests for a little bit. Okay, yeah, for me, it's all been climate related in some way, because it seems to be the most pressing urgency. And I did write an, um, a novel, um, but it hasn't been published yet. And hope it was it came very close to being published, but got rejected. But I fell down such a rabbit hole with it um, for a few years. And it's set in a near future where some of the climate problems have started to be resolved. So it's a world where everybody lives in half buried dome homes with fireproof coverings and that are hurricane proof. And, you know, people fly around in helidromes and um, there are carbon filtration plants pumping away everywhere, cleaning the air and cleaning the water and, uh, you know, great, giant sieve ships are cleaning, uh, you know, sieving microplastics out. They, like they're trying to work on these problems. So it's a very fragile, hurting world that's starting to heal a little bit. So, you know, I really got into the setting and into researching, well, what are the technologies that might work in the future? What are people working on? And what if in the near future they're put into place? What would that world look like? And I was so into it, maybe a little too into it. I was just like so zealously into it that maybe I sacrificed plot and character development. <laughs> so I might have to go back to that one, but it, yeah, yeah. it does sound yeah. a good one to go back to. <laughs> okay. Um, and when you were a child or a young person, what what were kind of your over overarching special interests then? Um, for a few years, when I was like eleven or twelve, I was massively into NHL hockey statistics. <laughs> Don't okay. I? It's just absolutely no idea why I had an uncle that we you know was taught that I admired and had talked about like the New York Rangers ice hockey team that's all it took I for some reason I fell down this rabbit hole I found a package of hockey cards you know that come with the bubble gum inside the packet and I was like oh these are all of a sudden it just became this massive thing I knew everything there was to know I knew how much uh, vulcanized rubber puck weighs I knew how how long the NHL had been in existence I knew the material the Stanley Cup had been molted out of I knew like all of these ridiculous statistics every player their birth date where they came from always in Canada it was just this, this massive thing that lasted a few years and then finally flamed out thank goodness <laughs> I wonder um everyone that's that's listening to this I wonder if you had any kind of special interests that were a bit out there or maybe you still do <laughs> if you do put them in the chat I would like to read them Okay, um, so tell us a little bit about how you started writing and how you first got published. Yeah, you know, I, I always was a writer. It was always my thing. So I went from that, you know, job as a business journalist to having my children and then you know, they were special needs kids and I freelanced mainly. I had a husband that had a very demanding job. 
So I would just do freelance writing, I um, either for business, and then I started getting hooked up with, a, uh, we lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the time, and I wrote for the journal, the newspaper there, they had a family insert every Sunday, and I would write stories for that about families and about schools and about kids, and I loved it so much. Um, and then at the same time, I to be closer to my own sons in school because of their own needs and just wanting to be nearby, I would volunteer at school to do anything that they needed me to do. And I spent a lot of time in the school library, um, just shelving books. And I started to read the stories and just fall in love with the profound and poetic and some of the most beautiful heartfelt stories for children. And why aren't we as adults reading more stories for children? Because they do something to your heart. They just touch you. They're just wonderful. I just fell in love with it. And I, I thought, okay, someday when I have enough time, that's what I want to do. And uh, we moved from Wisconsin to California about 14 years ago. And I got cancer, like the minute after we moved. And um, it was my mortality moment when I had to say to myself, well, what have you always told yourself are your life that you wanted to do? Write a book, write about family, write about kids, um, write about my family and my kids and all the quirky, strange ways and how I was a kid. And it, it just all came out. And that just is what started me. Okay. And um, how was that initial uh, get a publisher moment? For you. <laughs> it was oh it was uh on it was like winning the lottery it was unbelievable it happened really fast I didn't really know what I was doing and I think this is a good thing I wasn't concentrating on I want to get a publisher and I want to make it big all I cared about was just writing the story that I wanted to write that had so much of its roots in my family and my feelings and everything um but a friend of mine had told me about a right a residency a writer's residency called Hedgebrook. So I applied to it. I didn't think I would get it, but I did. And they let you stay. It was six women, um, in six cabins in the middle of the woods in a little island off of the coast of Seattle, Washington. They would cook all your meals for you. And all you had to do was write. And I finished um, The Sunday Birds there, my first book. And the other women helped me so much. They told me what to do. They said, okay, this is, a you know, you have a finished book. You need to find an agent. Here's how you do that. You know, here are a few people you could maybe call. This is how you go about it. So I did. And like within a few weeks, I had an agent. So it did go really fast. And then, you know. That's really good. Yeah. And what, and Maudie is what number book? Maudie is my third novel and my fourth book because I also have a picture book that came out. Um, I guess I could show you. The first one was The Sunday Birds. It's about Charlie and his cross country journey, and he's a bird lover. <laughs> the second was Stanley Will Probably Be Fine, and it's about very highly anxious and sensory. Uh, avoidant Stanley, who is having a, a lot of trouble in his new middle school. His friends are ditching him and he decides that he's going to do a brave thing. He loves comics. He's really good at comics trivia. He loves Marvel comics. And so he decides to enter this big treasure hunt all around downtown San Diego, looking for treasure hunt clues to win tickets to go to the big Comic-Con. And he's going to invite his best friend and his best friend is going to be friends with him again and everything's going to be all right but it doesn't quite go that way but anyway there's that there's, and um and then there's benji the bad day and me this was a little picture book it's just a really sweet picture book about two little brothers one autistic and one not and they're both having a horrible day and they both they save the day for each other more or less and it's the way that happens mm -hmm. And then just uh, last month came, came uh, The Fire, The Water, and Maudie and McGinn, which I've told you about, who's my first autistic girl. And people would always ask me, why don't you write girls? And I think partly was I had three boys and so much material. <laughs> but yeah, now I'm writing girls. And my next book as well is going to be called Invisible Isabel, and it's coming out in 2024. And that's also a course of girl. 
-hmm. And then I also want to say, too, um, in the UK, this is coming out in just a few weeks in the UK. It's mm -hmm. called Ada and Zaz. It's a um, HarperCollins Big Cat series book. They're doing, they're coming out in September with, I think, five or six books that are all neurodiversity related. And this will be one of them. And um, it's about a sensory seeker and a sensory avoider and how they become best friends when they move across this, the hall from each other and um, hey. in, in the building. And there's a, a pet incident that's based on our something that happened in our own family that is helps them become good friends. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, you sound like you've been very busy then, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what would you say are the inspirations for you? People or, um, you know, other books? Yeah, you know, it's hard to see where they come from. They just sort of come, I guess. You know, it's from different things. Like for Māori came, not. I'd say the other books came mainly from the characters, Charlie and the Sunday Birds came and they feel like my children, the main characters in my books in such a like funny way. But like Charlie came because it just felt like one day he just started speaking in my ear and I knew that I, I knew he had a story that I wanted to tell based on how hard our family trips had been on my autistic kids and um, how hard it is when you push yourself outside your comfort zone. I wanted to talk about that. Um, so that came with Charlie's voice. Stanley came because I had broken my leg and I couldn't make it to Comic-Con with the rest of my family, which is that big comics convention here in San Diego near where I live. And I felt like such a, I was too scared to try it because I had a broken leg, but um, yeah, I was too scared to try it. But then I thought, well, what if I wrote a book about a kid that was too scared to go to Comic-Con and he was really scared of everything, but he really wanted to do it. Like, what would that story be? That's where that came from. And Marty came from walking along the beach and passing this campground that was this beautiful little campground right there by the cliffs looking over the Pacific Ocean with RVs and camping cars and even tents and families and beach towels flapping on the lines and um, kids, you know, kids playing and running around and parents talking and barbecues going. And I thought, what would it be like to live here? What if this community, like, or a sense of community in an unusual place like this was the setting for a story? And what if it's the healing setting for someone that really needs community very badly? Mm. And so the Māori book started with community, really. Yeah, okay. So um, I think there's, I think someone's put something in the chat about special interests. So let me just have a look at that. Um, Sam says, my special interests were performing with friends, spending time in the library. It felt like a safe space. Wow, Sam, you wouldn't believe how much that has come up in survey responses for my dissertation. Uh, unstructured, there was a question, there's a question, not a question, a statement in the checklist about unstructured time at school. So many people said they went to the library or they read a book or, you know, whatever it might be um harry potter huge part of uh, your life uh, certain actors and musicians catalog and life stories crafting hobby crafts home diy huge animal lover yeah that really came up a lot too yeah. Uh, yeah. i've got so invested in them and any pets i've had yeah well i've got um actually the the puppy is out because otherwise he's a bit disruptive but I have got two spaniels asleep on my feet at the moment. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> oh, they nice. jump on my lap in these things, but I don't think they will tonight. They're tired. <laughs> um, have you got any animals, Sally? All my life I've had dogs, but I don't have them at the moment. We just happen to be at a moment in our life where we lost our, we had a golden doodle named Leo, who was like a human in a dog suit, this big 80 pound floofy guy with the most, he could smile, he could grin, he would go and grin at you. <laughs> he was the best and I miss him so much. I almost miss him too much that I don't even want to get another dog because I'm grieving with the, I'm still grieving. So, but, but who knows, it may happen again. Right now we're having to travel an awful lot. So we're putting off the decisions until all the travel is done. Yeah. So without a dog at the moment, but since I was four, we've I've always had a dog or two. Mm. Always. Or three. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If there is uh, anything that anyone would like to ask Sally, then do put it in the chat. Um, I'm just going to ask one last question. 
which I think is quite a nice uh, place to finish. It goes back to what we were talking about, how much has changed in the last five years. And I'm just going to ask, what changes would you like to see happening in the next five or 10 years? I would like to see, I think, more classroom and societal changes. When teachers write me and they say, wow, I've read your book and I never realized what was going on inside the mind of my student, but now I have a little better idea. That's the thing that matters the most, to, that just matters so much to me. And I want, I, I, I'm just hoping for that so much, you know, more, more changes that affect all the adults and all the support people around our kids for more compassion, more understanding about what's driving the behaviors. You know, I, I, you know we're all talking about acceptance, and, but, but it goes beyond that just to understand what is driving the behaviors, to be able to understand that, and you understand so much more because the behaviors are just symptoms of deeper things that we're still not really getting at. Mm, I don't yeah, absolutely. We seem to have, in the UK, we seem to have quite a behaviorist government at the moment, uh, which is not, it's not really helping. Okay, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, would you consider writing a novel for adults? I've thought about it a lot. Yeah, I yes, I you know a memoir or a novel. I did start writing a novel for adults once. Um, yeah, it's yeah yeah, it's definitely stewing in the back of my brain, and someday it's going to come out. Okay. Um, will your new book be available as an audio book? Um, the Fire, the Water, and Marty McGinn. Yes, it is already available as an audio book. Um, it's available in the U.S., and I'm going to have to work on finding ways to see how it can be available in the U.K. So we will we'll see how that goes. Okay. In the audio. Um, any advice on how to start my own journey using writing to understand better my autistic experience, procrastination, feeling numb, etc. Oh my goodness, just start. I, I would say to just start. It's a wonderful thing just to just to know that you want to do it, I think is enough reason to give yourself permission to just sit and do it and realize the writing doesn't have to be perfect. If it makes you feel better, don't get a fancy journal, get like a, a very cheap um, nonsense one that you don't have to worry about writing whatever just spills out of your head. It doesn't have to look pretty. Um, just start on in. Um, if you want to doodle or draw, just give yourself permission to get anything down that you would like. But you're making me think that it might be a lovely idea if we had a series of writing prompts for people to be able to start to get at some of these past memories and issues that we've shared and had together. If we've been, if we've grown up autistic, especially not knowing it, maybe that's even an idea for some sort of resource. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're happy to work with you on that after I finish my dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, if there are no other questions, then I'm going to let everybody get back to their day or evening. Um, so if you want to ask another question, put it there in the next 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'm going to let you go, Sally, um, and enjoy the whole of the rest of your day. Um, um, and yeah, thank you for joining us. And I hope so some of you are going to go and explore the character of Maudie mm -hmm. um, and we will be having a giveaway uh, on our Facebook page um, for a copy of more of um, the fire in the water and also a special little notebook that Sally has created mm -hmm. with something personal in it um, and that's going to be open to the UK or the US uh, I don't know how many of us on here are mostly UK. Uh, but anyway, watch out for our, our Facebook page uh, in the next few days uh, for that giveaway to go up. OK, everyone's saying thank you. It's a breath of fresh air, someone said. OK, so thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And thank you, Sally, for giving up your time today. Oh, it was an honour. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, okay. everybody, for tuning Thanks. in. Thanks. Bye. Bye.